Okay, so it's time for the next Physics 328 video. Um, what I want to do today is I want to do an example of the diagonalization of a rotational inertia tensor. And we'll do the square slab because that's a problem we've been working on for a while now. And so we know some of its properties. Um, and then after we do that, uh, I want to start to set up Euler's equations of motion for either an object that's rotating under the influence of some non-zero torque. And then we'll also eventually look up, look at the case of uh, free rotation. So no torque applied to a body. Um, Okay, and these Euler's equations of motion for rotating bodies, that's going to be basically our last major topic. And so the, the next few videos will be dealing with those types of situations. Okay, so let's do the diagonalization of a rotational inertia tensor. So what we know already is that if we had an XY coordinate system with a Z axis coming out of the board. And we had a thin square slab, sides of length A, and we pick as an origin the lower left corner, then we've already calculated this rotational inertia tensor. And the result was one third minus a quarter minus a quarter, one third, zero, 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 two thirds. And so there's some off diagonal elements. So the task at hand is to find the principal uh, rotational inertia. Uh, that's equivalent to saying finding the eigenvalues of the matrix representation of the inertia tensor. And we want to also find the directions of the principal axes. Just as by way of a general comment, if you saw an inertia tensor of the form like we've got where you have the three, three component is non-zero, but we have zeros in the one, three and two, three spots positions. Then you could right away identify the Z axis as one of the principal axes and the moment of inertia or the rotational inertia about that axis is the two thirds ma squared. So for this case, we can read off one of the principal axes and one of the corresponding rotational inertia. Um, but never, never mind that let's suppose that we had um, let's suppose that we didn't know that and we were just going to try to diagonalize a three by three matrix. Okay, so our goal is to diagonalize the three by three matrix that looks like this. For this process, I'll drop the factor of MB squared, uh, MA squared out front. Just in the end, we'll, we'll need to put it back in when we find the rotational inertia. Okay, so the process is to take the diagonal elements, subtract off the lambda, and then take a determinant, which would lead to a cubic equation in lambda, or, and so we'll be able to find the three roots of lambda, which will be our three eigenvalues. And so we want that determinant to be equal to zero. Okay, so first thing we do is we are going to write down the first element and then do a cross multiplication. So we get a one third minus lambda 
times one third minus lambda times two thirds minus lambda minus zero times zero. Okay, and so that's the first part. Next, what we'll do is we'll take minus this element and then do a cross multiplication like so. Okay, and so we get minus minus a quarter, so we get a plus quarter. And then we have minus a quarter times uh, two thirds minus lambda. And then we'd have minus zero times zero. Okay, and then last, we have just a zero, and then we would do this type of cross multiplication. But if we have a zero out front, then we just get a zero. So plus zero, and that corresponds to this third element. Okay, and so that's the full determinant, and we have to set that whole thing equal to zero. Okay, so there is a common factor of a two-thirds minus lambda, and so what we could do is we could write this as one-third minus lambda squared. We have two factors from the red term, and then we have minus a quarter times a quarter is minus a sixteenth. And then all of that is multiplied by 2 thirds minus lambda, and that's equal to zero. So expanding the square, we get 1 ninth minus 2 thirds of lambda plus lambda squared minus a sixteenth times 2 thirds minus lambda is equal to zero. And then a ninth minus a sixteenth, if you put that over a common denominator, comes out to be 7 over 144. So we get lambda squared minus 2 thirds lambda plus 7 over 144. And then we have 2 thirds minus lambda is equal to 0. Okay, and so the goal is to find the values of lambda that make the left hand side equal to 0. And one value is just lambda is two thirds. So one of the eigenvalues, one eigenvalue is lambda is equal to two thirds. And I'm gonna call that the third one because we could probably already see that that's gonna to correspond to a rotation about the z-axis. Okay, and then the second and, well, the other two roots are determined by this quadratic equation. And so lambda is equal to minus b, which is minus minus 2 thirds, plus or minus b squared. Uh, so that's 4 over 9 minus 4a times c. a is 1, and c is 7 over 144. And then 2 times a, so we divide by 2. Okay, so two thirds divided by two is one third plus or minus. Um, so if you actually evaluate the square root and then you divide by two, what you end up with is plus or minus root 16, which is one third plus or minus a quarter. Okay, um, if you take the minus sign, let's, call, let's say the minus sign is going to give us eigenvalue lambda 1. A third minus a quarter is a twelfth. So this is the negative root. And if you take the positive root, a third plus a quarter is 7 over 12. So this is the positive root. Okay, and so now we've got our three eigenvalues, like so. Okay, 
So let's find the eigenvectors. To find the eigenvectors or the directions of the principal axes, we're going to use that we require i times a equal to lambda times a. OK, and we'll start with lambda 1. So our original inertia tensor Forgetting about the m a squared out front for this part of the analysis. Look like this. And then we're going to have the three unknown components of our eigenvector. And we're going to try to set up a system of three equations where we're going to start with lambda 1 is equal to a twelfth. So we want that to be equal to 1 twelfth of a1, a2. Uh, let me, I'm going to change this to an ax, ay, az. Because we're going to use for the principal axes 1, 2, and 3. So I don't want to be confusing about that. OK, and so then we just do the uh, matrix multiplication. We should get three equations. The first one is AX over 3 minus AY over 4 is equal to AX over 12. And so if we multiply by 12, we'd get 4AX minus 3AY is equal to AX or we'd get 3ax is equal to 3ay, or ay is equal to ax. OK, the second one is minus ax over 4 plus ay over 3 is equal to ay over 12. And doing the same thing, multiplying by 12, we'd get minus 3ax plus 4ay is equal to ay. Um, so then we get the same thing. 3ay is equal to 3ax, or ay is ax. So these are the same. All right, there's a third equation which is going to be 0ax plus 0ay plus 2 thirds az is equal to az over 12. All right, and so this third equation, the only way we could satisfy the third equation is if az is equal to 0. There's no other choice. All right. Um, so what we could do is we could say, therefore, ax is equal to some constant, ay is equal to some constant, and az is equal to 0, so that the first eigenvector is equal to c110. And if we normalize it, so to normalize, so that its length is 1, we set c equal to 1 over root 2, so that when lambda 1 is equal to 1 twelfth, then a1 is equal to 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 0. And so that's the diagonal. It's a diagonal in the xy plane which we already know is one of the principal axes from previous analyses that we've done. OK, so next we take lambda 2 is equal to 7 over 12. And we're going to require that 1 third minus a quarter, uh, 0 minus a quarter, 1 third, 0, 0, 0, 2 thirds 
times, again, our unknown components of our eigenvector is 712 AX, AY, AZ. Uh, okay, so AX over 3 minus AY over 4 is equal to 7 AX over 12. Uh, so divide, uh, multiplying by 12, 4 AX minus 3 AY is 7 AX. Uh, so let's subtract off 4 AX and we'd have minus 3 AY is equal to 3 AX or AX is equal to minus AY. All right, the second equation is minus AX over 4 plus AY over 3 is equal to 7 AY over 12 multiplying by 12 minus 3 AX plus 4 AY is equal to 7 AY subtract off the 4 AY and we get the same results So these are the same. The third equation is going to be 2 thirds AZ is equal to 7 twelfth AZ. 2 thirds AZ is equal to 7 over 12 AZ. And like last time, the only possibility is AZ is equal to 0. Okay, so our second eigenvector then is going to be we're free to choose a constant for, say, AX or AY. I'm going to choose it so that what we end up with is C1 minus 1 and 0. We have to have the first and second components be opposite sign. Oh, sorry, normalizing. So normalization would set C to be equal to 1 over root 2 and a2 is 1 over root 2, uh, 1 minus 1, 0, and this is when lambda 2 is equal to 7 over 12. All right, last one is the easiest one. In this case, lambda 3 was equal to 2 thirds, and we're going to do the exact same thing again, only changing the value of lambda to be two-thirds. AX, AY, AZ, two-thirds, AX, AY, AZ. Okay, so AX over three minus AY over four is equal to two-thirds AX. Um, so maybe the best thing for us to do here is to multiply by 12 again. So we'd get 4AX minus 3AY. And then what's 12 divided by 3 is 4 times 2 is 8 is equal to 8. AX. Okay, so that means minus 3 AY is equal to 4 AX. In the last two examples, we've seen that the first and second equations always lead to the same condition. We'll get something different this time. So we have minus AX over 4 plus AY over 3 is equal to 2 thirds AY. We'll do the usual multiplication by 12. Minus 3 AX plus 4 AY is equal to 8 AY. And so what does that mean? Minus 3 AX is equal to 4 AY. Um, these two are now different.
the only way that you could simultaneously satisfy these two equations so for example so let, let's say from one we say that um, a x is equal to minus three quarters a y and then let's sub into two and sub into two what would that lead to? So it's minus 3ax, which is minus 3 quarters ay from equation 1, is equal to 4ay. Let's multiply by 4. So then we would say 9ay is equal to 16ay. And the only thing we could do is say ay must be equal to 0. But if ay is equal to 0, then we could go to equation 2 or equation 1. It doesn't matter. And we would find that ax must also be 0. OK, so we still have a third equation to do. And that's the easy one. You get 0 ax plus 0 ay plus 2 thirds az is equal to 2 thirds az. So the third equation is 2 thirds az is equal to 2 thirds az. And so you could choose whatever you want for az. I'm going to choose that az is equal to 1. And that means that our third eigenvector is 0, 0, 1, which is normalized. It, it obviously has a length of 1. And this is for lambda 3 is equal to uh, 2 thirds. So what we've determined then is the following. Let's make a little table. Principal axes. So the directions E1. Uh, one of them was 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 0. So in a vector notation, that would be i hat plus j hat with the 1 over root 2. And the corresponding rotational inertia about the principal axis. This was an eigenvalue of 1 12th, putting in the ma squared we get I1 is equal to 1 12th MA squared. The second principal axis direction was similar, except we had a negative sign for the second component. That was the eigenvalue 7 over 12. And then the third one, which we just did, is just k hat. And that was the eigenvalue of 2 thirds. And then there's an ma squared factor. So for our square slab, as we had already previously found, the principal axes directions, the way we've labeled them, we had an E1 along the diagonal. E2 is an axis that, okay, what we've labeled it as is being positive in the x direction and negative in the y direction. We may have drawn it going in the other direction before, but that's okay. And then we have a E3 coming out of the, coming out of the screen towards us. Okay, good. And so for rotations about E1, I1 was equal to uh, 1 12th MA squared. For rotations about E2, I2 was 7 over 12 MA squared. And for a rotation about the Z axis, E3, I3 was 2 thirds MA squared. Okay.
perfect. So that's an example of diagonalizing a rotational inertia tensor to find the principal axes. <laughs> okay, so the next topic, the next uh, and final major topic that we're going to talk about is Euler's equations of motion. All right, so what we want to imagine is imagine a rigid body undergoing some kind of rotation. Um, now, we've seen that we could pick any origin in that body and we could find a rotational inertia tensor. And we found that it's convenient, if we can, to work with a inertia tensor that's diagonal because then the expressions for things like the angular momentum and the rotational kinetic energy become quite a bit simpler. So it's convenient to work with a coordinate system that's aligned with the principal act, well, sorry, with the principal axes of the body. So if you had some fixed coordinate system and then initially you align them with their principal axes, but then your body starts rotating, then your fixed coordinate system is no longer aligned with the principal axes. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to work with a coordinate system that is rotating with the body. So think of us on the surface of the Earth. The Earth is a rotating rigid body and we are in standing on its surface. So we're in that rotating reference frame. So in some sense, we're always living, experiencing that perspective. Uh, and so we need to come up with the mathematical framework to describe um, the dynamics of that kind of system. So if the body is rotating, we need a coordinate system that rotates to preserve the alignment with the principal axes. Um, so if we're in a rotating reference frame, then it's always accelerating. It's changing its direction constantly. And so that's not an inertial reference frame. So this is not an inertial reference frame. So we have a bit of preliminary work to do to try to understand um, how to describe quantities in a non-inertial reference frame. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to try to show. I'll give you the end result now, and then we'll see if we can deduce that result. So we want to show that if we had some time derivative of the angular momentum in a fixed reference frame, so this is going to be in an inertial reference frame. Then that's going to be equal to dl dt in the rotating reference frame in a reference frame 
that is fixed to the rotating body uh, plus an additional term and that additional term will be the angular velocity vector omega crossed with the angular momentum L. Okay, so the picture is that we'll have a coordinate system and let's say in the fixed coordinate system we have x, y, z. So the unprimed coordinates are the ones that are fixed. And then what we imagine is that there is some kind of rotating frame. So it's a bit hard to draw, but we have an X prime and a Z prime and a Y prime. And there's some kind of uh, rotation axis omega and the purple rotating frame is rotating with the body along that axis and there's some unit vector n hat that gives that's aligned with the angular velocity omega so it's the direction of the rotation axis okay and then so what we're going to do is we well let's just make some notes uh, the x y z frame is fixed. The x prime, y prime, z prime frame is fixed to a rotating body. And omega is uh, the angular velocity, angular velocity, and n hat is the direction of the rotation axis. Okay, good. So what we could do is we could imagine, I'm not going to draw it on here because it'll make the picture too crowded, but let's imagine we're trying to specify the location of a point P. So a point P in the XYZ frame is given by, so its position vector is r is just x i hat plus y j hat plus z k hat. Um, in the x prime, y prime, z prime frame, its position is just r prime, and it's x prime i hat prime plus y prime, j hat prime, plus k, uh, z prime, k hat prime. Okay, and so these unit vectors, uh, i hat prime, j hat prime, k hat prime, are obviously not aligned with uh, i hat, j hat, k hat. Okay, now these two position vectors describe the exact same point relative to the same origin O, and so these are identical vectors. So R hat, uh, sorry, vector R and R prime, R and R prime describe the position of the same point relative to the same origin O. Therefore, these vectors are equal. They just have their components specified relative to different coordinate systems. OK, now what we're going to do is we're going to try to write down the velocity of this point. So maybe this is some point within the rigid body and we want to describe the velocity of that point. So V is going to be equal to, in the fixed coordinate system, it's easy. We just take the time derivative of each of the components 
and we get a simple expression. So we want to do the same thing for the primed coordinate system, but we have to be careful because this is now a rotating system, and so at some time t, the primed unit vectors point in some direction, and then at some time later, those directions are different. So we have to note that in the primed coordinate system, uh, i hat prime, j hat prime, and k hat prime are not constant because the coordinate system is rotating. So our first task, or our task now, is to figure out what are the time derivatives of these primed unit vectors. Okay, so v is also equal to d our prime dt, right, and that's going to be, uh, well first there's going to be dx prime dt i hat prime plus dy prime dt j hat prime plus dz prime dt k hat prime. That's normal, right? That's, that's the usual thing. But by product rule, we have to say, well, since i hat prime is not constant, we have to worry about its time derivative. And same thing for j hat prime and k hat prime. Uh, k z prime, sorry. z prime d k hat prime dt. This first set of terms is just the velocity in the prime system. Okay, so that means what we have so far is v is equal to v prime now it's plus x prime di hat prime dt plus y prime dj hat prime dt plus z prime dk hat prime dt. So these additional terms are the velocity of point P due to the rotation of the primed reference frame. All right, so what I'm gonna to try to do is I'm gonna to try to draw a picture of what this might look like. So, what color? We drew omega as a red vector, okay? So I'm gonna to try to draw omega as a red vector. I'm gonna draw it vertical for the purposes of this picture. So there's omega. And then we had, I think our purple frame was the primed frame, purple, yeah. So let me just draw the x prime axis of this frame. And so maybe it looks something like this. And so this is, i hat prime at some time t1. Uh, and if we've got a rotation in that sense, then what will happen is i hat prime will rotate about this angular velocity axis, like so. Okay, I can draw in here, the other thing we had in that other picture was an n hat, so n hat just specifies the direction. Okay, and let's imagine that the angle between the rotation axis and i hat prime is phi. 
So then we wait a short time and what we'll have found is that our axis will have rotated a little bit and we we'll end up over here and what we've got is i hat prime at a later time t2 is say t1 plus delta t okay so if i draw then a perpendicular from the omega axis out to the tip of i hat prime at time t1 and then the tip of i hat prime at t2 it'll look something like this and i want to specify another angle and the angle that i want to specify is this one and so we'll call that angle delta theta so what I'm going to be interested in is this length of arc. And so I'm going to say that that piece of arc has a length of delta i hat. And I want to know its magnitude. Well, how are we going to figure out its magnitude? first thing we need to note is that we have a right angle triangle and one of our right angle triangles looks like this so we've got a vertical axis and then a horizontal axis and this is i hat prime and this is the angle phi that we've drawn so if this is a right angle then this is the side opposite of phi and so this has a length of i hat prime sine of phi. And so let's just worry about the magnitudes of things. Okay, but the magnitude of i hat prime is just 1. So what we end up with is sine phi. So then over here, the radius of this vector that's perpendicular to omega is sine phi and this blue piece of arc has an arc length that's equal to the radius times the angle and so what we end up with is sine phi times delta theta okay well Let's calculate then the magnitude of the change in i hat divided by the change in time. So this rotation delta theta happened in time delta t, and so that's equal to sine of phi delta theta over delta t. But delta theta over delta t is just omega. It's the rate of rotation, and so this is equal to sine phi times omega. Okay, so we've got the magnitude of, so let's just say where the rotation delta theta occurs in a time delta t. Okay, so we've got the magnitude then. We take the limit uh, that delta t goes to zero, then the magnitude of this time derivative that we're trying to calculate. Uh, I dropped my primes at some point, so let's, sorry, let's put that back in. We have to have that prime there, and we have to have a prime here. So the magnitude of the time derivative of i hat prime is then sine phi times omega. Okay, let's now think about the direction of delta i hat prime. Um, so if we draw the picture again, well maybe 
maybe we could just look at this picture here and this is going to be delta i hat prime vector not the magnitude but the actual vector with the direction and what we have then is i hat prime plus delta i hat prime is equal to i hat prime at a later time <coughs> and so what we see is that uh, let's see i hat prime is perpendicular to omega omega is vertical and delta i hat prime is horizontal it's also perpendicular to i hat prime right we have got a perpendicular right there and so if it's delta i hat prime is perpendicular to i hat prime and to omega then cross product kind of makes some sense and you just have to figure out what's the right direction if we put our our right arm in the direction of omega and then curl our fingers to be parallel to i hat prime our thumb points in the correct direction for delta i hat prime and so that means the cross product that we want to write is omega crossed i hat prime so delta i hat prime is perpendicular to both i hat prime and omega so we can express d i hat prime dt as omega cross i hat prime it has the right magnitude because if we write the magnitude of the cross product we get the magnitude of omega times the magnitude of i hat prime which is one times the sine of the angle between them which is that sine of phi and so we get omega sine phi which is what we already deduced for that magnitude okay likewise we could do a similar argument for j hat prime and k hat prime the only thing that would be different is that the angle phi would change depending on which unit vector we were working with okay so that means that this expression that we were trying to calculate x prime di hat prime dt plus y prime dj hat prime dt plus z prime dk hat prime dt could be written as um, x prime omega cross i hat prime plus y prime omega cross j hat prime plus z prime omega cross k hat prime which is equivalent to omega cross what x prime i hat prime plus y prime j hat prime plus z prime k hat prime but this is just r prime and so therefore v was equal to v prime plus this expression that we just worked out was equal to omega cross r hat prime plus omega cross r hat prime or going back to the type of notation that we were using at the beginning v is dr dt in the fixed frame which is equal to dr prime dt in the rotating frame plus omega cross r prime but since as we said before vector r and r prime describe the same point relative to the same origin we could write that dr dt in the fixed frame 
Oh, I should have had a prime here. I guess dr dt in the rotating frame is the dr prime dt is dr dt in the rotating frame plus omega cross r. This expression, which we derived for a position vector, could be applied to anything, right? We could describe the angular momentum of some point or the angular momentum of some body, and we go through the exact type of argument that we just that we just thought about, and what we would find is that this result applies to any vector in the primed and unprimed coordinate systems. What we're going to be interested for our purposes in is the angular momentum and that expression that we wrote down at the beginning was that dl dt in the fixed frame is equal to dl dt in the rotating frame plus omega cross l. Okay, and so that's the consequence of working in a non-inertial reference frame. The benefit is that we're going to be able to stick with a rotating reference frame that is always aligned with the principal axes of our rotating body. Um, okay, so we can now use this for our equation of motion. Let's use this result in our equation of motion for the rotating body. So the equation of motion is that the torque is equal to dl dt, and that's valid in the fixed reference frame. But now what we can say is that must also be equal to dl dt in the rotating frame plus omega cross l. OK. Um, we know that dl dt is equal to the inertia tensor dotted with um, Oh, sorry, let me back up. We know that L is equal to the inertia tensor dotted with the angular velocity. And so that means DL dt is the inertia tensor is a constant. But then we have d omega dt like so. And we also could write that omega cross L, therefore, is going to be omega cross L is going to be I dot omega. OK, so here's where we get the real benefits. If we are using a primed coordinate system that is aligned with the principal axes of our body, then we can simplify quite a bit some of these results. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm going to start, I think we'll need more room. So let's, let's think about omega cross i dot omega. 
okay, um, if I is diagonal, then we have I1, 0, 0, 0, I2, 0, 0, 0, I3, and our omega vector is going to have components along these principal axes. And when we multiply this out, we just get a simple result. I1 omega 1, I2 omega 2, I3 omega 3. Okay, so that means that omega cross I dot omega or omega cross L is equal to, so we can evaluate our cross product using the determinant of a matrix. So we're going to have components along the principal axes. So the principal axes have directions e hat 1, e 2 hat, e 3 hat. And then the first vector is omega, so it has components along these axes. And then we have i dot omega, which we just worked out. It has components i1 omega 1, i2 omega 2, i3 omega 3. And so when we take that determinant, we get e1 hat. And then we have, let's see, omega 2 omega 3 i3. Minus omega one, omega three. Uh, sorry, no, that's not right. It is omega three and omega two, so omega two, omega three, I two. And then let's do this plus e two hat. Uh, now. Uh, so we usually put a minus sign, so I'm going to cross multiply the other way. So we'd get omega 1, omega 3, I1, minus omega 1, omega 3, I3. And then we get plus E3 hat, and we'd get omega 1, omega 2, uh, I1, no, I2, minus omega 1, omega 2, I1. Okay, now clearly there's some simplifications here, right? The omega-2, omega-3 is common in the first term. The omega-1, omega-3 is common in the second term. And omega-1, omega-2 is common in the third term. So therefore, the equation of motion becomes... Okay, so let's collect everything. N, the torque, is dl dt in the rotating frame plus omega cross L, which leads to... Okay, so we have three components for our torque. These are components along the principal axes. And so dl dt is going to be, l is going to be i1 omega 1, and then we take a time derivative, so we get a dot. And the second component of l is i2 omega 2, then we take a time derivative, and i3 omega 3, take a time derivative, plus. And so this next term is what we just worked out. We get omega 2 omega 3. And it's I3 minus I2. So this is omega 2, omega 3, I3 minus I2. And then we have omega 1, omega 3, I1 minus I3. And then we have uh, omega 1, omega 2, I2 minus I1. Omega 1, omega 2. I2 minus I1. And these are 
Euler's equations for the motion of a rotating body in components along the principal axes. Okay, so I think what we're going to do next time is we'll imagine what happens when you've got a freely rotating body. And so a freely rotating body is going to be one in which there's no net torque on the body. Um, and so we'll do some analysis of these Euler equations and see where that, where that takes us. Okay, so thanks very much. And we'll talk to you next time.